We're all we're all The August 28th meeting of the Scarborough Planning Board will please come to order. We'll all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, will you please call the roll? Here. Winking. Here. 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 Thank you. Uh, for the purposes of this meeting, uh, the applications 4.02 from the Morrison Center has been tabled at the request of the applicant and 4.05 Crossroads Holdings, LLC, has also been tabled at the request of the applicant. Turn to the approval of the minutes. Uh, are there any corrections to these minutes? I have one correction that I've spoken to Doreen about. Uh, on the second page of the minutes uh, concerning Allagash Brewing, uh, where if my name is mentioned, that Rachel mentioned, uh, I also asked for a survey of the tree save area in between the building and the driveway. I'd simply like that reflected in the minutes. With that change, do I hear a motion? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Moved by Rick Meinking, seconded by Jennifer Ladd. All in favor, please call the roll. Rachel Henriksen? Here. Yes. Rick Meinking? Yes. Roger Bewey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. And James Hebert? Yes. We do have a full planning board here tonight, so the uh, 
alternates are welcome to comment and discuss, but will not be voting this evening. First item on the agenda, Storage Realty Corporation requests an advisory opinion to the Zoning Board of Appeals to expand a non-conforming use at 46 Saco Street. The property is further identified as Assessor's Map Lot R15, Lot 59. For, this is subject to a public hearing after both parties uh, have had their presentations. For the purposes of that hearing and anybody in the room who would care to comment about that, Please, when you approach the podium, give your name, address, and you have three minutes to make your comment. Eric. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Storage Realty Corp is in front of the planning board uh, to expand a non-conforming use in the rural farming zone. This is at 46 Saco Street. The zoning ordinance requires all non-conforming uses that are proposed to be expanded to receive miscellaneous appeal approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals. As part of the zoning board's process, uh, the application is first referred to the planning board for an advisory opinion, and the applicant is seeking that advisory opinion tonight. Uh, the applicant is requesting uh, an expansion of the number of storage buildings on site, and upon uh, a potential approval of that by the zoning board, the, the project would need to come back to the planning board for a formal site plan review. Uh, with that, I would turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and for the applicant. Thank you to the board. My name is Steve Bushy with Goral Palmer Consulting Engineers. Here on behalf of uh, Storage Realty Corporation, Eric's kind of outlined uh, the basic premise here is that they're looking to do self-storage uh, buildings. I'm guessing most of you are all familiar. Uh, single level. Uh, they are currently considering if they are successful with the zoning board process and coming back before you folks that the storage units could be uh, a mix of climate controlled and uh, non-climate controlled spaces. Uh, they've got to consider that uh, if this all moves ahead. I'll note Storage Realty has owned the property since 1965, so they've been uh, a very long time owner and in fact appeared before uh, both the ZBA and the planning board in the past. Uh, we have three buildings there, as you can see on the site plan uh, that are existing, and those two are non-conforming. And in the past, there have been um, uh, Board of Appeal approvals to allow those non-conforming uh, structures uh, to occur. They were under the category of warehouse spaces. Uh, there have been subsequent uh, certificates of occupancy that have been issued by the town for some of the uh, lease tenants in those spaces, and that's gone over a period of 30 years or more. Uh, Brian Longstaff was kind enough to send along all the old files that at least he could pull together for, uh, for the site. And so within those records, there are basically the same sort of activity and requests that we're setting before you folks tonight uh, that have been approved in the past. That said, uh, the proposed use of self-storage is uh, what I would characterize as fairly benign. It's just that, storage units uh, for people to come in, lease space, and uh, store their belongings. Uh, looking at a similar access condition or basically the same access as what's out there today off of Saco Street, so that would be to the right side of the page as you're looking at it. It's an 18-acre piece of property, so it's fairly sizable. Uh, what you see there in the middle is the area that's open, and it is relatively wooded and, and uh, forested around its perimeters. Wazomski uh, Spring Campground is more or less to the north. I believe the municipal boundary is uh, basically on that uh, northerly line of the property as well. They'd approve, or they would pursue a, a phased approach to this, so what they're looking at would be an initial phase that on the north side of this uh, drawing here to the top would be basically six buildings uh, for an, a total amount of about 34,000 square feet of space. If they find that the business is uh, successful, they would pursue additional uh, buildings around the perimeters here that you can see. They're also considering the idea of uh, outs outside storage for uh, boats, RVs, and that sort of thing that there's probably going to be more and more of a demand for given the housing styles that are uh, 
uh, fairly common nowadays in that people are in apartments and they have things that they need to get stored. That appears to be the popularity of these uh, storage units in the first place. The owner here has gone through and done a marketing study. Obviously, this is an investment of sorts, and uh, they wanted to know if the market here in southern Maine and Portland uh, could um, handle additional storage, and the marketing study proved that, yes, indeed, there is certainly capacity for additional storage units to be constructed. Uh, all the buildings, just single level, probably not much more than 12 to 14 feet in height. Uh, metal cladding provided in the uh, materials. Uh, a few images of the typical storage unit, you know, multiple doors along the sides, maybe some along the end. They try to offer a, a mix of sizes because not everybody needs the same sort of size, so there'll be uh, a number of small units upwards to bigger units where you can perhaps park a car, that sort of thing. Uh, there have been a few staff comments with respect to site plan and things that would be talked about uh, if we were uh, successful through not only tonight's advisory uh, opinion from you folks, but the ZBA, obviously, and that is uh, site planning pieces b related to buffering. Uh, there is a fire hydrant that uh, draws off of the uh, spring that the fire department uses, and they obviously want to retain that sort of access, and we would obviously be... Uh, very cognizant of that and work with the fire department to make sure that they're happy. The owner wants to retain that hydrant and that relationship with the fire department so they don't have any issue there. Uh, they've already installed a security gate for access to the property and uh, that would be enhanced by providing a perimeter uh, gate or perimeter fencing uh, around the entire site as time would uh, proceed once uh, some of the clearing and so forth. I would expect through site plan that you folks Again, if we're successful to get to that point, uh, would have lots of comments and, and thoughts about buffering and so forth. And we're certainly uh, amenable to talking about all those things and making things uh, work in that respect. But first, we need the use piece uh, and the ZBA to uh, allow us that. So with that, be open to any questions from you folks. Thank you. Uh, this item, as I said, is available for public comment. Is there any member of the public in the room or online who would care to make a comment? If so, please approach the podium. Good evening, board members. My name is Ross Hickey. I live on 25 Lady Slipper Way, and I'm one of the abutting residential property owners. I've listened carefully to the proposal, and I'd like to take a moment to request um, to express my concerns. The enlarged, expanded traffic and hours of operations that are proposed are incompatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood, in particular with respect to the, gener the noise generation that will occur and the hours of operation. A 24-hour-a-day operation will mean that unlike any other businesses in the area, Customers could be present at any time with little to no oversight. Thus, a person could choose to access, access their unit at 3 in the morning with producing as much noise from their vehicle, music, physical move, move, uh, moving of items, let alone their headlights <clears throat> from their car that could negatively impact the neighboring residential properties. The statement in section I of the application that the proposed use is not considered a significant generator of noise is not accompanied with any documentation on how this statement was arrived at. The application references that the proposed use aligns with other businesses along County Road. However, unlike those businesses, this property is not in a commercial zone, or if it was, we wouldn't be here tonight. 46 Saco Street is not on County Road, and it abuts multiple residential properties, as acknowledged in the application and as evidenced by the folks here tonight. This proposal is incompatible with the existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, intensity of use, visual impact, and its proximity to other structures and the density of development. Under your performance standards for storage facilities, a lot its size is limited to five acres total, and the impervious surface should not cover more than 50% of the lot on which the storage facility is on. These standards should apply regardless of the location. The enlarged, expanded, and converted physical area that we're talking about today is three times greater than the current 
storage facility, and it will convert almost 18 acres of what is mostly mature woodland, which was acknowledged in the application, and to impervious surface. The property also abuts a great pond of well over 30 acres. There is a steep incline on the north side of the property abutting Wasamke's Pond, and that is, consists of sandy loam. <clears throat> As the schematic shows, because the proposed setbacks are not based on shoreland zoning, there's a strong possibility of erosion and runoff that will not be properly prevented. If shoreland zoning regulations do not apply because of a technicality, the principles in them that are set forth are still sound ones to follow to ensure that a wetland ecosystem is being protected. The pond in the abutting uh, forest hosts a diversity of animal life, including bald eagles, which are regularly seen flying over the pond. The proposed buffering for abutting property owners does not properly mitigate the expanded and enlarged uses that are being proposed. In section E, it references, please, quote, mature vegetation, please, please which will be up. used up, will be used, thank you, used as buffering. Yes, the mature vegetation exists, but the problem with the mature forest is that under that canopy of trees, it's wide open. Relying on this to act as a screening for light from both the security lights which are proposed and the additional noise is simply not feasible. The only fence that is mentioned in the application is not a privacy fence, but a chain link fence which will do nothing to prevent unwanted noise and light. In fact, it's not referenced there for buffering but as a security provision. For these reasons that I have articulated, I would ask the Zoning Board of Appeals to not approve this miscellaneous appeal for expanding a non-conforming use. Thank you. Thank you. And is there someone else? Please give your name and address. Hello, I'm Rebecca Parker. My address is 97 County Road. I am the abutter, I believe to be the largest right there. Um, I agree with everything the previous speaker said. I first want to thank the board for the original denial of this application as the standards and conditions required by the terms of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance were not met. And I thank you again for the denial of this current appeal before you for some of the following reasons. It is not compatible with existing uses of surrounding businesses and residential areas. This is my home, not compatible with existing generation of noise and traffic. It's not compatible with 24 seven hours of operation. I own Parker's Farm and Market. I chose this spot specifically because of the beautiful fields, the location and what I could do for this community. And to see this, everything taken away by a zoning, by a standard that should be followed. There should not have to be an appeal. This is, we have set rules and ordinances for a reason that we shouldn't have to come here and beg for our, what we, what we live for. Um, in addition, public safety concerns will certainly increase as an existed wooded area becomes a commercial site. Commercial site will have a direct negative impact on current use of my abutting farm. My animals are back there, This my dairy cows. So I need you to hear me when I say that when you're talking about waste, whether it be sedentary from the plowing, whatever they use, I am telling you the Department of Ag has no record of information regarding a plan submitted by 46 Saco Street regarding guidelines or regulations on developing a commercial stormwater treatment area abutting grazing farmlands. I'm telling you that the Land Bureau nor water division within the Department of Environmental Protection has record on file regarding the commercial development of waterfront property at 46 Saco Street to address storm water runoff, et cetera. I will also say that there's 
As said before, because of the mature forest back there, there's no way that you're not gonna have complete vi visibility from every single vehicle and the headlights, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this is my home. This is my business that I search to have that perfect piece of property and please abide by the standards that you already have in place so I can do what I came to do here. Thank you very much for your time and attention to this meeting. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Do we have anyone online? All right, thank you. The public hearing is closed. I do want to call the, the uh, attention uh, to the fact that we are actually not the Zoning Board of Appeals. I, I am very happy that we are not the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, <laughs> considering what is, what is before them and listening to the testimony that I've heard. Um, we are the planning board. We, we make an advisory opinion that goes to the ZBA. If the ZBA agrees that a project can go forward, it comes back to us, and that is the point at which it must meet all of the zoning standards that includes appropriate lighting, appropriate fencing appropriate amount of permeable surface, appropriate stormwater plans, uh, appropriate business hours, appropriate noise mitigation. In other words, so many of the things that, that you've spoken about. Um, I urge you to continue to follow this process uh, and to take a look at the ordinances as they are reflected in the site planning ordinances, because if the ZBA does agree that this is a project that meets the town standards and may go forward, it comes back to us for scrutiny of those standards. Uh, I welcome you if that happens, if the appeal is approved. I welcome you to come back to us if this application comes back to us as a site review application. Uh, and rest assured that we are pretty scrupulous in looking at the standards uh, and as is the planning staff uh, who work with applicants uh, until they are very clear, until the applicants are clear what their responsibility is in terms of building and in terms of meeting our codes. Saying that, I'm going to turn this over to members of the planning board to see if anyone would like to make a, a comment or a statement and a reminder, uh, we are here for an advisory opinion. Rick Meinking. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm having some difficulty, uh, and this is directed to the applicant, I guess. Um, the appeals for restrictions from a non-conforming use, it does say that the impact and the effects of the enlargement, extension, expansion, resumption, or conversion to another non-conforming use on existing uses in the neighborhood shall not be substantially different from or greater than the impact effects of the non-conforming use before the proposed enlargement, extension, expansion, resumption and conversion to another non-conforming use. I'm having difficulty in seeing how this proposed pro project is going to fit in that space. Um, I don't think we can, I can honestly say that today that is considered a self-storage facility. As it, as it looks today, based on the information I have and looking at the, uh, the Google Earth telling me that this does not look like a self-storage facility now, and it is being proposed to do that. And I don't think, at least from this planner or member of the planning board, that this is um, an acceptable non-conformance use of something that is already non-conforming, if that makes any sense. 
So I'm not strongly, I don't feel strongly like I could get myself behind this. Uh, but that's just me. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Jim? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my concerns here are uh, self-storage requires very high illuminance on their property with regard to the requirements from a security and a security liability standpoint, insurance standpoint. Um, and there are still residents that live in the North Scarborough neighborhood, a lot of them that still do there. And uh, there's also going to be the, the turnpike spur that will be less than a mile on the other side of them going through connected to Route 114. And uh, with respect to Stephen and the engineers at Goldwell Palmer um, for, pour, for putting their application together, but um, I, 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 I do not have a supporting opinion of this project. I don't think compatibility-wise with a very high illuminance in this area, the effects of lighting pollution on an agricultural area that's directly next to it. Um, they've proven that on the West Coast with um, uh, the impact of light pollution to sea life. It's the same here with animals. We see it in our houses uh, whenever a light gets too close to our, to our property. Um, so from a light pollution standpoint uh, and with all the other development that's been going on, this really isn't, this is not compatible with this area. And I would ask uh, to have it be noted that um, as part of the ZBA's mission is to decrease non-conformance and not expand that. And I think that, uh, I'd like to think that the ZBA will um, We'll uh, think back to that as well uh, when they go and review this. That's it. Thank you. Roger. Um, actually, I think you stated it well, Rachel, uh, regarding our role. And I think what I'm hearing from our colleagues is basically this ZBA's you know, um, process that they're going to have to go through to really determine whether this meets the criteria that that they need for this to be approved. There's, there's, a, there's a number of um, hurdles for this project to go forward. And um, like Rachel said, even if the um, uh, ZBA approves it, it's still going to go through a rigid and a rigorous um, evaluation. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I'm not prepared at this point to stop this project, but I, I do think it faces some challenges and I do empathize with the, with the abutters on this. And um, that's where I see our role right now. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Jen. Um, I generally share the same opinion. I think, you know, um, the language provided to us for how to consider these types of um, reuses or expansions uh, I, you know, I, I actually think Rick reading it, I think it's really pretty clear this does not, this does not seem like an equivalent or a less intense use on this site than what is happening um, there now. And that's really, that's how I interpret that, um, that changes shouldn't be different or greater than what's going on there right now. And so I think that, you know, I, I can see a couple of scenarios where a similar um, model could could potentially fit within that definition, but what? But the plans that have been presented to us, in my opinion, don't don't meet that. Thank you, Ben. I would just echo the comments of my colleagues, um, and I tend to agree. So I have no further comment. Thank you. Um, I have serious concerns that, fortunately, the ZBA is responsible for answering or, or addressing. Uh, among those concerns that I have are the fact that um, I would certainly like to know if the warehouse uh, currently is open 24 hours a day with bright lighting. Uh, in other words, what's there? If it is not, then that is a significant change. Um, the amount of space that is planned uh, although it appears that it's going to be phased in, uh, it does appear as though it would, at a minimum, double, if not triple, the size of what's there. That is a substantial change, as, as far as I'm concerned. All of this is something that the ZBA is 
is, has to handle uh, and has to deal with. I had notes about the hours of operation, the 24 hours. I had notes about the concerns of the surrounding property, uh, the, the buildings, and I have a little note uh, if you come the ZBA approves this and you come back to us, is you're going to have to prove a lot of things to us. Uh, the things that you would have to prove to us is that the buildings would not be visible from the surrounding properties or roads. You would have to prove uh, to us that you, uh, there appears to be an office building there, yet you have indicated that the proposed buildings will not require any on-site septic system beyond what already exists on the property demonstrate that. Uh, you have indicated that the buildings will not result in any significant emissions to air and water as any HVAC will be electrical. <coughs> demonstrate. Stormwater management, best management, demonstrate. You have indicated a chain link security fence around the property that's good for security but it's not good for buffering. Uh, and as you know, uh, Steve, the, uh, the chain link fence must be either must be painted. It cannot be simple chain link. And I would suggest at a minimum, if you come back to us, that that would be a stockade fence and that all lighting inside of it would be full cutoff and that the operation would not be 24 hours a day. Uh, let me see if I have any other minor notes here that might be of interest. I think that will do it. Um, our, our advisory opinion, I suspect, to the ZBA, uh, I, I think would be in terms of um, we have concerns first about the allowability of the use in that area given the size that is proposed, given the operation that is proposed. Uh, if it comes back to us, if the ZBA sends us back to us, uh, we are going to be scrupulous in, in reviewing it. Uh, so um, I think, is that enough, Autumn, do you believe, for the ZBA? Typically, no. We, um, we will generally just write up the summary of the meeting and then send it to the ZBA. So if the board's comfortable with that, we're happy to do that. Yeah. Um, why don't uh, you send me, um, when you have something written up, if you send it to me, I'll review it and assure that it meets with my understanding of, of what we said. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Um, yes. Do you want one next to the last word? Because the chair is the final word. Go ahead. Just a thank you to the board. Uh, it's been very enlightening, and I appreciate the uh, input from the neighbors as well. Those are all obviously big things that we can carry back to uh, the owner and uh, get prepared for the ZBA and understanding all of those comments, how we can uh, hopefully uh, get over some of those hurdles. We'll see how the process plays out. So I appreciate the, everybody's candor. Thank you very much. We Thank are you. probably noted for our candor. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, 4.03, Allagash Brewing Company requests site plan review of a 9,300 square foot tasting room and demonstra demonstrative brewing operation. The project, project is located on lot two of the Higus District subdivision, assessors map R52, lot four. Eric. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Allagash is requesting site plan uh, review and approval for a tasting room and demonstrative brewing operation. Uh, during the last review at the August 7th planning board meeting, the board requested further parking lot landscaping, an inventory of trees in the tree save area, and some clarification on the nature of the overflow parking area. Uh, staff suggests the board require two additional islands in the parking lot, which could be accomplished via uh, making the existing two islands, um, they're currently two parking spaces wide, but making them one space wide and relocating the uh, additional two islands um, created by that elsewhere in the lot. Um, the use of uh, brewing or small batch processing as it's defined in the town's ordinance does require, uh, is required to meet the standards of small batch processing 
in the zoning ordinance. Uh, these performance standards require the board find several of the standards are met uh, relating to odor, traffic, neighborhood compatibility, and noise. Staffs provided the board with a draft motion for consideration with these findings and several plan changes in mind. And with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And for Allagash. Hi, uh, Chris Taylor with Sebago Technics. Um, on behalf of uh, Allagash Brewing Company, um, we have, since we were last here, we had a, a number of different um, submissions and um, letters back to the board and to the town staff um, kind of addressing some of the comments that were outstanding. And just to um, run down through some of the, the site plan changes that um, occurred since we since we were last in front of the board. Um, that included um, adding deciduous trees on the um, outside of the parking lot. Uh, that was kind of at the request of the board. Um, I know that the, the shade trees were an important factor um, or consideration. We also added a few um, evergreen screening trees along Market Street uh, to help increase the, uh, the buffer between Market Street and the corner of the building. Um, we also uh, included a uh, layout for the future parking area that was heavily discussed. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so this is the, a layout showing um, what a future parking expansion could look like if the need arise and demand is, um, uh, you know, occurs at the brewery in the tasting room. Um, you'll see on the, there's a, a landscape island between the, the current park proposed parking lot and what would be the future parking lot. Um, and that's where some of those um, additional uh, shade trees are going in that area there. So those would be uh, to remain in the future as well with this layout. Uh, we've, we submitted some pictures of the tree save area. Um, I know there's some questions around uh, the types of trees and the, the nature of um, the existing trees in the area. This picture here is uh, taken on the, there's an existing trail that's kind of shows up on the plans um, just north of the building. And that's where that, that picture is taken from. It's looking south towards where the building would be. On the right side um, is where Market Street is. Um, so I'll note that when this picture was taken, Market Street was, um, the clearing limits for Market Street were already cleared. The road was at a gravel uh, level. So the, it was basically brought up to grade. You can kind of see the white on the far right of the picture over there. Um, that's where, you know, there's snow on the grounds during this condition. So it's also um, low, you know, no, no deciduous trees um, cover in here. So there's a, there are a number of different species in here that are evergreens and deciduous. Um, the height is very significant, I would say. It's, it's going to be taller. The existing trees vary in height. You can see some, there's small saplings in here, but there's um, quite a few mature trees as well that are over 30 feet tall. Um, and I think it'll provide a, a good buffer of the site as well. I'm not, Autumn, if you have, yeah, this, the picture on the left here. Uh, so this is a, the picture or the image from Market Street. Um, there's a, basically on the plans, you'd be um, kind of to the southwest of the driveway entrance. This is looking at a hydrant that's along the edge of Market Street. And right in front of the hydrant, or right beyond the hydrant would be where the driveway entrance would go. Uh, so those those trees beyond, um, kind of just above that hydrant in the picture, those are where the tree save that tree save area is. So a lot of those tall uh, mature trees are would be in that tree save area. Um, and then in addition to the tree save in front of the building, um, there would also be Market Street is as part of the subdivision approval has street trees along the edge of the road as well that would go in there. Um, another thing that a minor plan change, uh, we are showing the full extent of the trail that goes to the south on the property. Um, before it's kind of just cut off at the, at the tree line, but that does extend further to the south um, off the property. From there, um, I know that it's proposed to be extended um, to the utility corridor. There's a utility corridor that runs from Hagus into um, kind of the, the Downs uh, center area. And that's going to be double, 
proposed to be doubled as a, uh, a part of the trail network. And so that's the connection um, that this site will get to the, the trail network on, across the downs. And then it continues through the site onto the sidewalks for Market Street and into the rest of the, the trail network kind of to the north. Uh, we also submitted um, some revised uh, cut sheets for the lighting, showing that the CRI value uh, um, changed from 70 to 80 as requested. Um, we, sh we provided a, a cut sheet of the pavilion structure that's off to the right of, of the building. This is what... Um, this is kind of from the building manufacturer, the cut sheet from them. So this is showing the wood canopy structure itself. There is a, um, a metal roof that's proposed to be placed on the build or on top of it, it, it that currently exists and that would get relocated. Um, I do have some renderings I can bring back up if there's any questions about the look of that. Um, we also worked with uh, the town's traffic consultant uh, to finalize the uh, traffic impact numbers or uh, estimated trip um, generation for the site that increased um, the estimated trip counts just slightly in the PM peak hour and Saturday peak hour. Uh, and that was based on just kind of reviewing all the areas within the building that were accounted for. We added a few trips uh, to account for some of the uh, manufacturing or brewing space area at the request of the, the town's consultant. Um, and the last plan change was to widen the driveway entrance a little bit to help accommodate some of the truck turning movements as was noted in the town's traffic consultant memo. That's, uh, that's basically the rundown of the plan changes since we've last been with you. I'm available for any uh, questions or further comments you have. Thank you. Uh, this item is available for public comment. If there is any member of the public in the room who would like to comment on this, please approach the podium. Is there anybody online? No hands up. In that case, uh, public comment is over, and I will turn this over to the planning board. Uh, who would like to start? Roger. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, gee, this is awful loud. Um, I'm glad you um, you agreed with the um, traffic engineer regarding you know widening the entrance. That seemed to be a stumbling block that's you know has existed over a couple of uh, meetings now. So I'm glad to see that. Um, the uh, I need I need a clarification on the. Uh, the concern about the tree save areas, because there's three tree save areas, Eric. And are we concerned mostly with the one that's by the pavilion, or are you are you are we insisting on surveys of all three? Uh, no, I raised the issue originally, and it was just that. Uh, by the pavilion okay. to know what was there, because the question was: was there adequate shade for the driveway area? Okay. Have you considered that? Because you don't have any photos of that particular. Um, we didn't submit photos of that just because it it um, you're kind of standing in the middle of the woods and just it would be a picture of trees without any reference points really. Um, I can tell you from being out on site and it we do have it when the pictures were taken. Um, and last fall, there, the tree save area was actually marked out, and there is significant um, trees in that location. It's pretty similar to um, the kind of the density in the tree nature, uh, the species that were included in the, the pictures that were submitted. Okay, so just, just for clarification, that's the only one that you have some concerns over, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> how do you, I, I don't think I heard you say any you know, comment on the additional islands in the parking lot. In other words, instead of going taking up two spaces and having two islands, reduce it down to one space for each one and have four. How do you feel about that? Um, I guess our, our, our opinion is that larger islands serve a better purpose for, for reducing the, the impacts of... Um, massing on parking lots as well as providing 
um, a better growing um, area for trees that actually will be able to have large canopies and provide the shade and the buffering that um, you're trying to achieve with the, the, the whole purpose of having a landscape island. Um, my professional opinion is that it, you know, having a fewer number of large uh, landscape islands is better than, and at reducing the massing of a, of a parking lot works better than having um, more but smaller uh, parking islands. On, on those islands that you have currently have, are you are you planning to have more, um, like shrubbery and things like that on those instead of just trees? We're showing a, a large um, canopy tree in there right now, um, with just uh, with grass underneath of it. I believe is what the landscaping is. Because if you're going to take up two spaces for just a tree, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that I would agree with your, I mean, you're a professional, you know, professional, but I don't know. Um, one tree on a single parking space seems reasonable. You know, if you're gonna have two spaces, I would think you might wanna include something else in to really have an impact. So, um, I think, my, yeah, my biggest concerns were the, were the traffic and, um, you know, the entranceway and et cetera like that. So, um, like I said last time, you know, last time you are here, I, I don't have a problem with the with the uh, seating walls. I kind of like them myself, but the um, the ordinance requires the seat. So I think you're gonna have to combine, you know, um, abide by that. So I'll, I think I'll finish at that. All right, thank you. Next, Jim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for adding the shade trees. I really appreciate that. Um, I guess one um, request, if I could, if I may, uh, on the, uh, I think it's page, uh, well, the landscaping plan, there's the, um, the white oaks that you have for the, for the shade trees there. Um, it's on uh, page seven of the PDF. Any chance we could have something that's more, um, that has a better blooming color in the fall for autumn? I know white oaks tend to just kind of go to brown, if I'm not mistaken. This particular oak, white oak. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the specifics of of that. Oh, um, it sure. was with a. Uh, it was designed by a landscape architect. Generally, I know we are trying to provide some different species. Uh, there are maples proposed, um, kind of in the landscape islands, and I believe at the end of the parking lot as well. So there will be some. Um, some maples in there that generally have better color in the fall. No, I, I appreciate that. It, it just looks like on the periphery, on the south, plan view south, it just seems to be like a lot more of the oak trees than there are of the, I think, type AR, which is the, the red sunset maple. And I guess just minor, but I'd love to see, uh, they could be different species of maples, I guess, but just more, more colorful trees that bloom better in the fall. That's all. Okay. That's for me. And then my last comment, a um, little bit more technical, uh, and maybe the site plan hasn't been updated yet, but uh, on the lighting site plan, it still says a, uh, a 70 um, CRI color rendering index value for uh, the Beacon Viper fixtures for the parking lot. Um, and I'd like to have those as 80 CRI if possible, please. Yeah, the, um, the photometric plan just didn't get updated. We did submit the, uh, the cut sheet and do plan to install the, the, the ADCRI. And I saw that. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next. Anyone? Jen? Uh, sure. I'll go. Um, I did notice on the plans, um, so it looks like you removing the proposed, I forget what the actual um, terminology was on the prior set of plans, but a nod to some sort of food truck or other sort of temporary um, kitchen type use adjacent to the, um, the canopy structure, but you're retaining the concrete pad and utilities there. So presumably at some point in the future, this might come back as a potential use. Yes, it, it's still intended to um, 
to have food service on this facility in the in the concrete pad that we've called out here um, we're we're just not at a point of being able to show the specifics of what that um, structure would look like um, and what would, are basically asking to get going on this plan um, and trying to finalize the details of that um, further along in construction. It would, would come back um, for approval of that later. Is that something, Eric, that, or Autumn, um, there must be a threshold at which that would come back to this board, or would that fully be a staff approval? Any proposal to go under that pavilion would have to come back for uh, site plan amendment through this board. So any sort of structured right. kitchen. Right. Now there is the possibility that we have a food truck ordinance in right. place by then and it may or may not. It depends on how the ordinance is required but we would definitely keep you apprised of that. Sure. Okay. Just curious. Um, I'm curious uh, for a number mm -hmm. of reasons. Um, one just frankly this seems to be a very compatible use for what you're proposing to your site and so um, whether you propose it at this time or in the future, um, I'm aware of other examples. I don't know if it's yours in particular, but uh, similar facilities in the region that um, often struggle down the road in adding an additional type of food use or food service or whatever that looks like um, because they didn't plan for it at the beginning. And so I think it's a great amenity to offer um, customers of like what fits well within this program so um just not that you're not doing it but i think that it's a it's a good thing to um accommodate for at this time particularly in terms of like the utilities here so that's good um and also i whether you propose that at this time or not at this time mm -hmm. i know that there were there were uh, discussion topics around this previously with regard to its impact on um, trip generation to and from the site, whether or not there's a food use or not that um, that can impact trips. And then just more, um, you know, more common sense. I think that if um, there isn't a food use provided here, you know, we're currently looking at or recently approved, I can't remember. Um, a restaurant across the street. So we should reasonably expect that people are coming back and forth between the two, um, hopefully walking along this great sidewalk facility and the crosswalk on Market Street. Um, so I just, I, I see a lot of um, shared benefits, I guess, between, between the two projects um, and the development overall. Um, the, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I guess I'm curious to hear maybe from any other board members about the um, the sentiment towards uh, fewer larger landscaped islands versus um, more smaller dispersed landscape islands. Um, I have experience with uh, tree failure <laughs> because they've been planted in really small locations and as a result of I think sometimes trying to like cram too many into into small places um, and so I can appreciate the you know the request to kind of provide more planting material material and room for growth around these um, tree root systems mm -hmm. um, so that's a nothing comment I, I don't have an opinion I'm curious um, it could be sweet either way I, I, I share your uh, your opinion that it's it's the canopy that's, you know, it's the landscaping that's important to us. And so whether that's in a larger grouping or smaller groupings, um, can, I'm curious to hear of others' uh, takes on that. And then uh, lastly, there was a comment about um, the truck turning in and out of the site. Um, and again, I, I know I commented on this last time, but uh, I just feel very strongly that large trucks should not be pulling in and out of the site and headed towards um, sort of into the, the Downs project. Um, they should be directed out towards Haigas Parkway. And so, um, you know, whatever that we can do language wise to encourage that, my, my preference would probably be um, some sort of conditional language around hours specific hours for deliveries um, to make those write-ins and write out, sorry, write, writes in and lefts out um, 
feasible with the the road width that we have on Market Street. And that's that's all I have. Thank you. I think you were right the first time. Right in, right out is leading right to down, downtown, and you'd prefer that it be left out only, unless it's a specific time when the Market Street area is not going to be crowded, like after 10 o'clock at night or something. Correct. Other than I think it would be, it will be incredibly difficult based on the development of this site in its individuality to facilitate a WB50 movement further down at an intersection that they don't have control over. So Haigas Parkway uh, is my strong preference for deliveries in and out of the site. And as you mentioned before at our last meeting, it sounds as though that is oh, the overwhelming preference, that there isn't, it's, it's not advantageous for you to go the other direction, but whatever we can, um, you know, by, by language, however we can support that, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Ben? Um, just to address Jen's question, personally, I'm comfortable with the, the two islands, because you have additional shade for the parking lot, you know, on the side that you're planning. Um, it doesn't, as a matter of personal opinion, I don't have an issue with that. Um, and just in general, I'm very excited for this project to move forward. And I don't have any additional comments at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Noah. Go ahead, Rick, if you want, I can go after you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Rick, oh. I missed you. Oh, okay, it didn't matter. Um, yeah, I think we're almost getting there. My only comment relates to uh, the island. Um, it seems a shame to put both those islands right next to a sidewalk or kind of a pathway into it from the parking lot I would prefer keeping, you know, more parking toward that sidewalk and moving those. I think the island that you have right by the, the nice landscaped entryway is, I'd rather see it maybe off either side, further down. The idea of having these islands is to, you know, somewhat mitigate some of the island effects that go on with the heat and uh, provide a nice uh, shaded area. Um, and I just don't think these are the best places for those islands. I appreciate having the shade trees around the perimeters, those five, I think they're the um, uh, white oak. Um, but it just, to me, having those two islands so close together is only accomplishing it is not a, accomplishing the real goal of having the islands. And I'm wondering if working with staff, we could try and figure out better placement for those islands. Um, that's all I have. That, I'm, I'm just stuck on those. Yeah, I, that's it. Okay. Moving on. Noah? Hey there. Um, I have a, a few questions for you. Um, the first is on, on the two tree, tree saves that are adjacent to each other. There's a split down the middle, and there's, I think, an arrow pointing toward, towards restoration mix. Can you explain to us uh, what that split is between the two tree saves? Yeah, there's, a, um, there's a, an existing, you can see it here on the picture, um, there's an existing like logging road that runs down, um, and that's where the, the two tree saves are split. This is where that kind of path is. Um, or existing uh, break between the trees. So we're just trying to represent that um, accurately on the plans of that's an existing condition that exists out there. Okay, great. And then, then related to that, what is a rest, what is, what are you defining as a restoration mix? Um, it is a, so it's an actual mix that is created. Um, I believe that the company is uh, New England wetland plants. Um, and it's a, it's, so it's not a, a grass, like a lawn mix. Um, it does have some grasses in there, but there's some other um, plants that are, um, you know, native and will grow taller and just kind of provide some more variety um, and natural feel other than uh, like a manicured lawn would be. Okay, so how will that area need to be managed or maintained or will it not be and it'll be sort of let come back, regrow? 
uh, that area is is kind of intended to you know seed it um, or or put this seed mix down um, let it take and just kind of leave it alone and it wouldn't be mowed it would be let to kind of naturalize and actually um, you know any tree growth that happens would just kind of benefit and kind of fill in that trail and um, provide additional screening okay that, that sounds great thank you um, I do want to express my concern with the dumpster backing up to the tree save um, you know it, things happen when wind blows things trash constantly into any of that habitat there um, I don't necessarily have a specific suggestion of where to move it I just like you to, to think about the, the impacts the alternative impacts there um, my Next question about the vegetation is related to that. I'm looking at your planting schedule and I have to say I express my real frustration with it in that it's um, completely dominated by non-native species, largely from Asia and Europe. Uh, we have, the planning office should have given to you guys a, uh, a doc, clear document about um, plants that are acceptable to planting um, in developed areas. And uh, this, this planting schedule is, is largely non-native species. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I know this was reviewed previously and I apologize I wasn't here for that to, to bring this up, but this is something that is, is super important. If I were voting on this, I, I would vote it down entirely just for that reason. Um, but I'm not voting it nonetheless. It's really important that that's here too. Uh, and finally, this is sort of maybe a, a little bit more of a, a broader philosophy question um, the Downs has been here, um, I, I, I'm, I've only been here since January, okay, so, but, so since I've, the Downs been here frequently, and every time the Downs is here, um, particularly Dan Bacon representing those folks, they describe this community as a multimodal community. And so by definition, multimodal is at least three or more ways of transportation, right, not just driving and walking, whatever else. Um, and, um, I'd like to think that biking is, a, is like the next most important possibility. And looking at your schematic here, there is a bike rack. There is a single bike rack. Um, and I guess I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, if you've had conversations about really encouraging alternative methods of getting to your facility, particularly by things like bike, and if so, how you would really encourage that, you, making a, a lesser need of, this, of these parking lots and greater need um, in, through bikes, particularly. Other than, you know, one bike rack is fine, but that's not really strongly encouraging greater transportation other than cars. Yes, um, so I guess a couple points on the, on the, the biking and, and multimodal. Um, so the Market Street does have um, that there built into the subdivision approval was um, bike lanes, I, I want to call them, I guess, along the shoulders where uh, there will be actually bike markings um, proposed. Um, and we are proposing three different bike racks. Um, there's one in the rear of the property for, we kind of aimed that for employee use. Um, there's one located, um, kind of at the southern port and portion of the site, right where the, the trail comes in towards the parking lot. Um, we were kind of thinking of that as if someone was using the trail system, um, biking along the trail system, they might use that location for bike racks. And then there's also one kind of to the south of the pavilion um, or uh, future kitchen, accessory kitchen. Um, and we thought that was kind of one of the more um, visible places from, from someone visiting the site and would, um, th they could use that if, uh, when they're going to the site as well. So um, we did kind of, we did try to consider, um, you know, accommodating bicycles and uh, bicycle traffic to the site as well as uh, pedestrian traffic and trying to, you know, really incorporate um, and providing options for the local um, people living nearby that may not be wanting to drive a car to the site. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Can you please comment on the plant schedule? Yes, um, I'm not a landscape architect. We did have um, lands registered landscape architect prepare the plan in our office. Um, 
and there were, we did see the staff comments regarding uh, the native species. I believe um, from my understanding of it is that um, most of the, the species selected um, were a, a slight hybrid of a native species. Um, and the reasoning uh, for using the hybrid variety um, was, is due in part to trying to make sure that the, the survivability of the plant and um, it, I guess um, to put it in a not so elegant way, but that some native plant, this is just my um, not expertise understanding of it is that some non-native or some native plants don't thrive in commercial settings and that they have hybrid um, strains that uh, survive better in, in around parking lots and, and these commercial type settings. And that's what was used in, in place of the uh, um, native varieties. Uh, so thank you for that response. I, I um, strongly disagree with you. Uh, and I would encourage you to work with our, our planning office. Um, they, they can help support uh, native plants that can be used in commercial developments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roger has a follow-up. Yeah, just a quick question. On your, um, the, um, the sheet you gave us, uh, the future pay parking plan, um, when I saw that, the first thing that popped out in my mind was, uh, do you have any plans for a pathway to get into that area? instead of people walking all around the paved area and coming in from the end? Um, I guess we, we haven't really considered that. This was just kind of a um, something we put out there as like this is what could be, this is the parking um, kind of configuration that could go in that area. Obviously, we'd have to come back um, with more details of, of access, pedestrian access, lighting, uh, landscaping, and, and that sort of additional features. Um, but this was just kind of our, the first, uh, just trying to show something of, to get the, help provide the board some information about what could actually happen out here and, and what um, kind of the number of parking spaces and the configuration is possible. Okay, um, maybe I could ask Eric this question then. Um, so when, if, if this plan gets approved in its current state, they can't use that overflow parking right now or they would have to come back later? No, they, they can use it because it is shown as having a gravel sub base yeah. that meets the town standard. So it, it's already accounted for in any impervious area in stormwater calculations as well. Okay, that's what I thought. So that's why I was wondering. I, I, I can just see people are just going to, they're not going to walk around. They're just going to walk between the cars and to get yep. wherever they have to go. You know. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, let me just clean up some details. Uh, you're all set. Uh, uh, understanding that while we did approve the bench seating, uh, the wall seating, uh, you also have to have uh, two benches. Near the door, front door. Uh, would it be possible for us to extend kind of that wall seating closer to the the building, or is, uh, or is uh, you're, so, you're, you're supposed to use those benches actually as a way to mark the major, the main entrance. Um, so extending the the wall seating doesn't actually direct people to the main entrance. Benches do. All right, then. OK. Uh, let me call your attention to something that uh, Noah mentioned, and then you mentioned, and that is that one of the bike racks takes up half of the double space of an island. At least it looks like about half from this. In other words, you've got a double island where the uh, crosswalk is. But you've got a bike rack there, and while I agree it's a good place to put a bike rack, then that means that you don't really have a double island there. Uh, and while a double island may be more conducive to health of trees as they get bigger, um, our audiences also call for islands at certain points. Uh, depending on the amount of 
parking spaces that there are. And by the calculations, there should be two more standalone islands. You could put two more double islands in, you could put two more single islands in, but um, by the ordinances, uh, the double islands count as one island. So we would need to see two more islands. Then um, you've asked for a sign waiver. Now, the reason for the waiver is that the two signs which were allowed, would be allowable um, are not 100 feet apart. But could you explain again why you think you need two signs? Yeah, the, the two signs that are proposed um, are existing are signs that exist at the at the Portland facility. Uh, remember, remember, remember the conversation we've had about this isn't Portland. So yeah, I'm not. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not presuming that these are okay. um, going to be approved. I'm just trying to iterate that these are existing signs that are trying to be reused, um, and that they're not new signs being created. So that leads to the request for the waiver. Um, and that, uh, that that doesn't lead to the request for the waiver. The request for the waiver is that you want two signs that are closer together than a hundred feet. Yes, and the signs. So um, why do you why do you need two signs? What's the thinking behind them? Why do you need that in the first place? The signs that are proposed are. Um, one-sided signs. They, they're not visible, they're not legible from the back side of it. Um, and so for that reason, um, we're proposing the two signs so that you can view them from both uh, ways on Market Street. So they're set at a diagonal, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, do they say the same thing? Uh, there, there were pictures that were, they do say Allagash Brewing, um, which is generally what they say. There's some small banners underneath um, that provide hours of operations and, and that sort of thing that are slightly different. They're slightly different sized as well. Uh, they will need to meet the sign ordinance and the planning department uh, reviews all signs for sign ordinances. So reused signs may or may not meet our sign ordinance. But you've asked for the waiver, so we'll consider the waiver for the two signs. Um, <clears throat> we also had a question um, about the overflow parking, which still worries me, I guess, in that that hammerhead directs people onto the grass, correct? For overflow? Uh, the the hammer, yes, that piece highlighted there would be the access to the overflow parking, correct? But what it is is still grass. Was it grass or gravel? It's grass on the surface. So how are you going to manage any sort of orderly parking in that area if it's simply, here you go, here's a hammerhead, here's a field park? Uh, what is the applicant is intending to do would be to um, put up some um, basically uh, reused wood uh, barrels as barriers with some rope in between. Um, they, you know, they they have these barrels that they use as part of the brewing operation, um, and so it's a good reuse of of some of the existing materials that they use. Uh, they use these. Um, to kind of delineate uh, the area that's allowed for drinking as well. Um, it's a, a pretty common at, at breweries to use these type of barrels as just because they're leftover materials. So uh, that would be the intent would be to uh, put these barrels up with some rope in between to kind of define where the parking lanes would be in the drive aisles. You're not planning on using them around the pavilion or the outdoor of the building, are you? To indicate where the drinking is? Um, I guess that's a, it could be possible to, they, they need to follow the, um, the state liquor license laws and whatever is kind of required by that. If they require some sort of barrier, um, then 
to define the the allowable drinking area, then um, they'll have to put up some barrier that meets the the or, or the code requirements there. Okay, um, if you're going to put something up that in effect ropes people off or can confines them to a particular space where they might be either eating or drinking, a Scarborough would have some standards. So double check, make sure you're. I don't want you running afoul of the state law, but also I don't want you running afoul of Scapro standards if you're going to going to be putting up something that says here's where you drink, uh, in effect. Uh, I still have concerns um, about the overflow parking, simply because I, I I'm not sure that barrels and ropes are going to do. Uh, I'm really going to do to keep people from ending up parking too close to the tree save or too close to uh, an area that actually leads to the brook. So um, I would like to see some sort of wayfaring signs that direct people to something that says overflow parking. First of all, so they're not wandering down the uh, driveway to the back of the building. The signs that say no parking along the side of that driveway, which I believe you have indicated on the uh, on the plan set, um, you might want to put up. Actually, I think you should put up a sign at the entrance to the driveway that goes around the back. You should put up something that says delivery only, employees only, whatever. Um, but simply, basically, something that keeps people away from there. Otherwise, you will end up with cars parking along that sign, along that road. So direct people correctly to the parking area, to the overflow parking area. And I would suggest that uh, you not direct them there specifically until you actually need the overflow. In other words, before you need... When you get close to needing overflow, first have barrels or something there so that people don't start using that area and getting on the grass before they need to, or before you need, need the use. In other words, exercise some control over that because it is grass. Uh, and I would suggest at any point where you're looking at to make that permanent, uh, you're going to have to put up a fence you're going to have to put up some sort of a marker that keeps more than the barrels and a rope that keep people from moving off of that area. That's a kind of a sensitive area since you have the underground sand filter there. Uh, and it is getting close to the tree save. So just as you have put curbs uh, along the parking area to stop people from going into the tree save, you also need to have something here at the point at which you want to come back to us and say, I would like to, we would like to put in, make this permanent. Because at that point, you also need lighting. So be very judicious in your use of that. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to confirm that the use the the kitchen operation, whatever it was, was withdrawn. But you are going to be leaving the lines in the utility lines in there just in case. Correct. Okay. What color is the roof of the pavilion? It's gray. All right. I have a draft motion. which is subject to Eric's. So the draft motion um, was updated to include a changing of the white oaks at the southern end of the lot to maple, to James's suggestion, um, updating the lighting specs, show ADCRI on the lighting plan to James's suggestion, um, providing a truck routing and delivery schedule uh, to prevent trucks from going through the downtown center and routing them to Higgins Parkway to Jen's uh, suggestion, as well as, um, actually, I think that was, that was it. 
uh, and the wayfaring, which actually is part of the discussion that we've had here, wayfaring signs. Um, could we also have the, um, the additions that Noah mentioned with regard to yeah. the, the – Oh, the landscape? The plantings, the seed plantings there. Are, well, you can explain it better than I can. Yeah, if you could, Eric, if you could put in – Um, something that says, let me see this, uh, something that, that says uh, the applicant will work with the planning department to determine that the appropriate native species mix is used for the planting, for the plantings. And then while I'm writing this in, I, the uh, addition of the two islands is still included in the conditions. Um, so I uh, just wanted to um, kind of gauge. It sounds like the board was a little split on that. So just making sure that um, we still do want that in there. Yeah, let me uh, get nods if that's OK. Remember, we do have uh, ordinances. Uh, I just want to follow up on, on actually your very interesting comment about the one of the islands having the bike rack in it, and that's defeating the purpose of it. So um, this should explicitly state how to deal with that. We can, uh, we can relocate that bike rack out of the, uh, out of the landscape island. OK. Uh, it is, uh, my point actually was that it was a double island, and half of it was taken up with the bike rack, leaving one, in effect, one island. So there are different ways that you could handle that. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Roger. Uh, yeah, on, the, on these islands, um, this is a question for Eric. Um, do we have a typical dimensions that uh, for parking areas that accommodate these islands? Uh, yes, the ordinance specifies that islands need to be a minimum of nine feet wide, which is essentially one parking space width. Okay, so that's typically what we do. I th yes, okay. yes. Just to clarify, these two additional islands, if approved, will also require trees. Appropriate landscaping. But they could. What they could do is take, right now they have two with two spaces. They could end up with four single spaces. Correct. It's up to them how they want to handle it, yeah. All right, I do have a draft motion. Eric will poke me if I'm reading it wrong. <clears throat> I move to approve the project entitled Allagash Tasting Room, proposed by Allagash Brewing Company, as depicted in plan sets prepared by Stabago Technics, dated 8 14 23, with the following findings and conditions. Findings The project includes construction of a 9,300 square foot tasting room and demonstrative brewing operation on lot two of the Higus District subdivision. The planning board finds the project meets the standards for small batch processing performance standards in section nine of the zoning ordinance. This includes with respect to compatibility with the neighborhood, odor, outdoor storage, noise, and traffic conditions. The board also finds the project meets the requirements of the site plan review and zoning ordinances with the following waivers and conditions. Waivers, one, site plan review ordinance section 4I1 to waive the requirements of the zoning ordinance signing regulations relating to the 100-foot required separation. This will allow both signs to be installed as proposed. Conditions, one, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall, A, provide a tree survey for the tree save areas at, in between, for the tree, one tree save area in between the building and near the pavilion and the driveway. You get to add that now. 
B, address the comments in the Barton and Lojudish memo, memo dated 8-25-23. C, provide the updated down stormwater management scorecard. D, the applicant shall execute and record a stormwater maintenance agreement with the town. The form of the stormwater maintenance agreement is located in Appendix 1 of the Town of Scarborough's Chapter 419 Post-Construction Stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance. E, provide formal approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District. F, update plan sets to reflect items discussed at the 8-28-23 Planning Board meeting. This includes I, one, excuse me, addition of two islands in the parking lot. Two, addition of two benches at the entrance to the building. Three, addition of wayfinding signage to the overflow parking area. Four, installation of wood rail fence or other barrier to define limits of the overflow parking area. Five, update lighting plan specification table to show 80 CRI fixtures. Six, change white oak trees at southern end of the parking lot to maple trees. Seven, work with the planning department to determine appropriate mix of native species. Eight, provide a truck routing plan and delivery schedule to route track, truck traffic through the Hygus Parkway. G, pay traffic impact fees totaling $30,026. Dunstan Corners, 11,216. Hygus at Route 1, 18,810. This shall be reviewed by the planning department. Prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall A, ensure off-site improvements required by the Downs TMP at Hygus Parkway and Market Street are installed and functional. Any occupancy of this lot before the office off-site improvements are installed shall be approved by Maine DOT. Three, prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall submit evidence in the form of a letter or plan prepared and stamped by a professional engineer who either prepared the post-construction stormwater management plan and its associated facilities or supervised the plan and facilities, construction and implementation. The letter or plan shall certify that the stormwater management facilities have been installed in accordance with the approved post-construction stormwater management plan and that they will function as intended by said plan. Four, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. All plan modifications are to be completed prior to scheduling the pre-construction meeting. Is there a second? I'll second, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seconded by Jim Hebert by three and a half seconds over Roger Bealey. Uh, all right, Doreen, please call the roll. Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Rick King? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. And James Hebert? Yes. Thank you very much. The project passes. Thank you. Welcome to Scarborough. Item 4.04, .04, NLM Enterprises, LLC, is requesting preliminary subdivision review of a 5.84-acre, eight-lock subdivision on Chamberlain Road. The project is further identified as Assessor's Map R79, Lot 14. Eric? Thank you, Madam Chair. So NLM Enterprises is in front of the Planning Board with a preliminary subdivision proposal for an eight-lot subdivision. Uh, this is just past the Morrison Center at the intersection of Highland Avenue and uh, Chamberlain Road. Uh, the subdivision does not include any roads or infrastructure and is intended for single-family homes. 
Staff's primary concerns at this point are buffering and protection of the wetland area, fencing to ensure safety from the neighboring railroad tracks, as well as provision of a sidewalk or in lieu fees uh, along Chamberlain Road uh, to meet the future land use plan standards as outlined in the 2021 comprehensive plan. A draft uh, motion of approval for the preliminary subdivision has been provided to this effect for the board's consideration. And with that, I turn it back to you. Thank you very much. And for the applicant. Good evening, Madam Chair and member of the boards. My name is Sean Frank. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics out of South Portland. Uh, with me tonight, I have uh, members of the uh, applicant and NL NLM Associates, uh, excuse me, Enterprises. Uh, Eric did a quick, uh, uh, good roundup on it. We're basically just under uh, uh, six acres of property um, located between Chamberlain Road and the railroad tracks uh, and abutting the, uh, the Morrison Development Center and the Pleasant Hill Disc Golf Course. Um, we are in receipt of, uh, as, as Eric stated, this is a, a relatively peculiar piece of land, the fact that it's in the R2 and in a pretty dense area of development, if you will, but there's uh, no utilities at all along Chamberlain Road. There's no uh, electrical service. Uh, we're in fact going to be uh, uh, working with CMP to extend uh, poles down Chamberlain Road. Uh, from those poles, we will then go underground to the individual service, uh, to service the individual units. Uh, there's no sewer and water within Chamberlain Road, so they will be serviced by uh, individual septics and, uh, and wells or a number of the other lots right there along Chamberlain Road. Um, uh, we are in receipt of the, uh, of the comments uh, from staff. Uh, from the wetland standpoint, uh, we think it actually works out better to have them on the one lot, if you will, not to have it as an under common ownership. Uh, that would require uh, the uh, formation of a homeowners association. Uh, you know, we're certainly more than happy to put up buffers and signs and those types of things in terms of uh, maintaining that buffer along that wetland. Certainly the whole intent is that the uh, development of Lot 8 uh, is uh, along the sideline of Lot 7 and that the uh, that remainder of land remains uh, undeveloped down through there. And certainly we'd be happy to do something like that in terms of deed restrictions associated with that as well. Um, in terms of turning that over to a, a land trust, I don't think we'd see any land trust that'd be very interested in, in, in that small piece of property down through there. Uh, in terms of separation from the railroad, I mean, if the, if the board thinks a fence is appropriate, uh, again, as you can see, there's a number of other homes along through there. Some have fences, some don't. Some have some additional landscaping. Um, my only other thought is, you know, uh, uh, we do want to talk to, to the town engineer about stormwater management. Certainly, we're not talking stormwater management associated with infrastructure because there's no roadway construction here, just associated with uh, individual lot development. So something more LID services, probably more along buffers is what we're really thinking about along the back of the lots, maintaining wooded buffers. Um, so certainly we'd want to just be respective of that too in terms of maintaining that wood, that wood buffer, if you would, between the railroads uh, that'll provide some treatment to us from the runoff standpoint, uh, as well as provide a, a, a natural buffer, if you will, between that and the railroad tracks. Um, the street trees uh, are fine, uh, the sidewalk. Uh, we haven't had a chance to discuss this with the, with the town engineer. Our concern with the standard sidewalk, as we all know, is you know, you basically you add a curb, you put a sidewalk in, which leads to drainage. Uh, the profile of Chamberlain Road is very flat. I think if anyone's ridden out through there, you can just realize, I mean, once you get down that little hill coming uh, from, the, uh, from the golf course side, excuse me, the disc golf course side, uh, <laughs> it, it flattens out quite dramatically going down towards Highland Avenue. So we really couldn't get water to move along a curb line. Uh, right now, it's just basically ditches. Uh, so, you know, whether that be a, a, a widened paved shoulder, perhaps, something along those lines that'll provide, you know, a, a, a access for pedestrians as well as for bicycles, uh, certainly we'd be more than happy to have that conversation with staff uh, prior to our final submission. Um, in terms of the remaining items, uh, we have been working with the fire department in terms of, uh, of trying to provide uh, access to an existing private hydrant out there. Um, again, right now, uh, public water is not available along Chamberlain. We did meet with the Portland Water District to discuss the possibility of extending it down through there, and, and unfortunately, uh, it's, it, uh, there's no assistance to be offered, if you will, from the, uh, from the Portland Water District, and the, uh, and the dollar figures associated with that are just, uh, are just too much to do that. Uh, certainly, the erosion sediment control, we did provide a narrative or a small detail, if you will, for the individual lot development, and certainly we'll provide more detail in association with that. Uh, again, we appreciated meeting with staff. We had a good meeting with staff to kind of review our proposal here. Uh, it is straightforward to a certain degree in the fact that, you know, there's no specific infrastructure. It's just basically the, the 
the subdivision of the land itself and then the, uh, the creation of the individual homes. Uh, certainly some details that need to be worked out with that. We have not had the opportunity to, to meet with the town engineer and certainly do look forward to doing that between now and our final submission. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I would conclude my presentation and certainly be happy to answer any questions that the board has. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is an item that is available for public comment. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak? So please come on up. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Brooke Fennell. I live at 74 Highland, so at the intersection of Chamberlain Highland. Um, I have no problem with the development there, but the only thing that I ask is to have some um, some some speed mitigation, if you can, coming down Chamberlain because the traffic coming down there, once you get beyond the houses that are there, people just fly down that hill. And coming to the intersection of, you know, Highlands, a stop coming out there, cars coming down Chamberlain are going well over the 35 miles an hour. So I don't know what that means. I don't know, you know, how we address that successfully. But that's my only, my only concern about adding more houses there is just if you can do anything to slow that traffic down there. Um, we have screeching tires and you know, slamming brakes and cars going into ditches regularly there. So whatever that takes. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I suggest that the planning department work with the police department uh, to see what's going on out there and see what options might be available. Sometimes it's who does the talking. <laughs> I, and <laughs> and uh, uh, I think uh, I think Sean's going to have to have a lot of conversations with planning as well. Um, questions, uh, comments from the board, Roger. Um, yeah, um, I'm familiar with this area and. Um, I know the other homes, like this lady's home, um, right along there, that's on uh, Highland, between Highland and the tracks. Um, and I was, when I was going by there the other day, I noticed also behind the homes, some have fences, stockade fences. There's one that has actually a berm, I think. Um, w would that make any sense? It, my, my, my only problem when you, the, then we're talking a lot of earth movement at that point, yeah. Roger. You know, we're going to be cutting every tree down so I can push up a berm and then kind of try to recreate something. I mean... This is a pretty substantial berm. It's, yeah, and again, I have a feeling it's probably associated maybe perhaps with some previous development up there. I mean, you know, there's, there is the railroad tracks itself. You have the old uh, concrete plant that was back there. Um, you know, was it associated with that? I don't know. I don't know the, the origins of it. Um, but you know, to put a, put a berm up all along the back of those lots, I just think would be uh, uh, you know making a much more major earth moving project out of this, and would you know it, would, would it be you know the the benefit would be worth the uh, the work to be perfectly honest with you. Well, let, let me ask staff um, when when a development goes adjacent to railroad tracks, I, I understand the safety issue. Does the railroad come into play on this at all, or? Is it basically the railroad was there and then somebody's come along and decided to develop the land and that's tough? <laughs> I mean, I, I haven't run into that in my time here in Scarborough, but um, I think the railway is not really involved okay. in the process. Okay. Um, because I'm pretty sure all the other homes that are along that, that stretch, basically they did their own put up their own fencing or whatever. Yeah, is. and again, some of them had fencing, some of them you could see maintained trees. I mean, there are some depths to these lots. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing on the R2 zone is it's, uh, if you have 100 feet of frontage, then you need 200 feet of depth. In this case, I think we have 110 on average, and there are 180 plus or minus in depth. So there is some depth to the lots, which allows, I think, uh, uh, for the front setback, the well in front, the septic in back, and still saving some space to the rear of that. Uh, for trees, perhaps, uh, for additional landscaping, perhaps. Uh, again, they're going to be individual homes or for, for a stockade fence, if that's appropriate to them. Um, again, if this board thinks, you know, geez, should a fence all along the back, I just, you know, uh, 
you know, sometimes you like fences and sometimes, and I, and I appreciate what the point is about, I truly do. It's just, you know, uh, 900, 1,000 feet of fence all along the back of that. I, it, it, it doesn't hit me as a great thing, but, uh, you know, we'll certainly be happy to talk to the board and staff about it. Okay, and, I, and I'll just go on the record once again saying um, the last time you, this was before the board, no, it actually was Morrison Center, when I learned that they were going to, the town has plans to redesign that intersection right there. And um, did you know about that? I had not heard about that. No. It, it would be a, probably a very appropriate, I would, I would appreciate it, probably an appropriate uh, thing to do. Uh, you know, to me the simplest solution is, right, is to make that a 90 degree corner there somehow and, and add another stop sign to it, or make well, it three ways have, all the way. I, I would you know. advocate for a 90 degree going right into Highland. And then just make it a three way stop. Right. So, um, that's all I have. Thank you. Jen. Um, <clears throat> Uh, prior to the topic being raised by the butter here, which I appreciate, um, I also had questions about um, potential speeding. This is my own, again, anecdotal observation from this area is that I, I suspect that there's a speed problem there. Um, and in addition to it obviously being a problem for the existing abutters, I definitely think that there is a there is a habit of speeding as been has has been described. So on this section of Chamberlain past Highland Avenue, um, and and even past the Morrison Center's um, driveway that exists, because there is sort of nothing in this stretch, but that now we will be adding eight driveways here where people will be in and out, and. Um, the, I saw in the application material that, you know, this isn't a significant traffic generator, maybe it doesn't need a traffic movement permit. Um, but I think, I think there are, I think that this type of development is coming into an area that is sensitive from a safety standpoint, just period. Um, and so I'm curious about what opportunities may exist between this project and the town um, to try and mitigate that because I think the worst case scenario would be somebody, you know, knowingly pulling in or out of their driveway um, into a corridor with unchecked speed on it. Um, and uh, I, we've, we've had some other conversations uh, at this board level um, about potential changes to the Highland and Chamberlain intersection, which I'm sure you will hear all about from Angela when you meet with her. Um, that could potentially help to that end, but I don't think it's like the one and done. Um, and so this gets to another comment that I have about um, the, I, I struggle here with the, uh, how to balance, how you will balance, I look forward to seeing how you will balance um, the preservation of existing vegetation on uh, the front side of these sites, so along Chamberlain Road, um, but not impacting site distance and visibility, um, but also providing some sort of buffer. So I think that's um, I think that's maybe a little bit of a challenge, but something that I'll be keeping an eye out for as we move forward. There was a comment about um, you know a requirement for two street trees per property. Uh, this is very wooded right now, so presumably there are trees there. How, you know, how, what does that, what does that look like? Um, and how many of those, if any, could stay through the construction? Would they be in the right of way? Would they be on the private, um, private lot side? Um, and again, bringing this up at subdivision level, because I think it's important, as if, was, if this was just one lot, that's kind of one thing, but because it's, it's in series. Um, and this, just this corridor is definitely, um, it's, it's very wooded, it's kind of dark, and so it, it's sort of tunnel-y feeling. Um, and so I, just, I, I do just generally have some safety concerns about the existing traffic situation there. Um, trees, sidewalks, um, I agree with you. It is very difficult to introduce a full curb and gutter style sidewalk facility on a road that is flat like this. Um, from a drainage and math standpoint. 
but I feel very strongly that pedestrian facility should be accommodated through this corridor somehow. Um, and there was reference made to it in the staff comments, I believe, about future um, uh, comparable facilities coming further down on Highland Avenue. Um, and so I think, you know, there is, there is a lot of um, multimodal activity on the right of way, at least for Highland Ave, the section probably to a lesser extent, but one would hope that with additional homes here, um, we may see an uptick in that. And I also think that, you know, the, the more multimodal that we can make our, providing multimodal accommodations often helps as a traffic calming feature as well, is where I'm going with that. So whatever that looks like, that's up to you to come up with a, um, I think a, um, you know, what type of infrastructure is proposed, but I do think that it um, will serve a number of different purposes in addition to, to um, being directly from our comp plan. Um, and to that end, your comment about uh, potentially widening the shoulder for that use, uh, I would have concerns that this would exacerbate a speeding problem, but again, look forward to further um, detail on that. And then uh, the last comment that I have has to do with the, some of the buffering topics here that we've been talking about. And I just, I'm, I'm so uh, keenly aware of a particular case that we saw um, years ago, I think, uh, at this point, where a property had been sold, I don't know how many times, maybe once, maybe more, um, but the person wanted to clear additional land in their backyard and found out um, af like at a point that they were sort of unhappy about, I think, that this was protected buffer area um, and required as an offset to an adjacent sensitive area. And so um, I, I, I would hope, I like the approach here of sort of like keeping whatever natural elements of buffering and stormwater treatment on these sites as possible. But I think it's extremely important to convey that in as many ways as possible. Deed language for sure. Um, literal markings in the field that cannot be interpreted as anything other than like, whoa, what I guess I shouldn't be doing whatever it is that I want to do. Pins, markers, boulders, signage, maybe not all of that, but um, you know, I think those are some strong options for helping <clears throat> to identify, again, not just, not just linear buffered areas, but particularly on the lot eight as you'll approach the, um, the actual defined uh, wetland areas. I think those will be um, key. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Meinking. Yeah, just to play off of Jen regarding the sidewalk, um, Eric, we have a an account set up right where developers can contribute uh, contribute 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 uh, funds to uh, for future uh, projects like a sidewalk, or maybe maybe bike lane put on on uh, on this road could could help with some of the speeding that goes on. So I would, you know, rather than say you've got to put in sidewalks, I would rather uh, take a little lighter approach and say uh, require some sort of contribution that you guys can work out at the staff level to figure out what would be an appropriate contribution that this developer could make for the future of, um, for the future sidewalk installation if that's the and I know it's consistent with our comp plan so I'm sensitive to that fact uh, so that would be my only comment uh, I think Jen uh, covered things uh, I'm not sure putting in a fence all that way at the start I think we leave it up to the homeowners how they want to buffer their property from the railroad track um, and and not require a fence uh, but certainly, um, you know, anybody, buyer beware kind of thing. There's railroad tracks behind your house. How are you going to deal with it? It's buyer beware. Well, and I will say, 
you can't hide them. I mean, you yeah. can see them from say, on Chamberlain Road. They're going to know there's railroad tracks behind them. So it, it, sometimes, it's, it's, I mean, I just took the down <laughs> easter from from here down to to North Station, and you look at some of these backyards that have fences. There's trash all over them, hanging onto it. I don't know if it makes any difference. Um, that there's a fence there. Well, that's just that's for the one size fits all, but I, I appreciate that. And just to go back to Jen, if I could a little bit, especially on lot A, obviously it, it's hard to do a hardscape plan for a house we don't have or a design, but I mean, it, uh, certainly if we can agree as a minimal type of thing, the, like we say, the, uh, the, the, the pins being sat with no buffer notes on them, some type of signage associated with that. Obviously, if there are stormwater buffers on the back, those will have specific easements associated mm -hmm. with them, as you were talking about. Um, but like lot eight, I could certainly, you know, and again, if we can work with staff, perhaps as we actually, you know, actually have a plan come for the building permit, you know, I, I'm sure we can incorporate some type of hardscape along that buffer line as well as as part of that lot development. I just don't want to uh, yeah, be making those option. decisions, if you will, for a home I haven't even seen yet at this point in time, and for a person obviously that wants to buy a house and it's, you know, their home and certainly wants to incorporate some of their own design features into that. I'm all, I'm all done. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, Chair. thank you. Uh, ben, let's start, let's start at the end and work forward here. I just have a question, I guess. Um, it's NLM Enterprises' intention to sell all eight lots to individual property owners? Uh, no, they'll, they'll build some of the homes themselves. So, you know, they'll be, yeah, but yes, all, all, eight, all eight lots will be sold to eight individual single-family homeowners, yes. And so in that, you know, likelihood um, building a uniform fence along the back is kind of useless because each owner could then take it down as they like on their own property. Well, it would be it would be kind of hard to, to, to probably say that right, that, you know, that that's common ownership or something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the intent is not to have a homeowners association associated with this, uh, just because there really is no infrastructure to take care of. There's no common space that we're proposing along those lines. Uh, and like I say, from my standpoint, if there is ever an issue with, you know, the town noticing the code enforcement officer noticing that, you know, this some potential impact on the wetlands, you're dealing with one person. You, you know who it is. It's the homeowner right there. So rather than trying to deal with the homeowners association, we just thought it was cleaner. Thank you. Also, um, I do agree with the comments that you know, Rick raised about maybe donating some money to the fund for the the road. I appreciate so that. that. I, I don't think we'd better. heard of the in lieu of before, well, so uh, we'd we'll certainly be happy to have that conversation with staff. Yeah, I think I think Angela should be able to point you in the right direction on that. I think it's our multimodal. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, the word multimodal. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it is it's the multimodal fund, and that's why I did want to start because I know Angela's going to be an important part of this conversation, and I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> and I have not I have not had that very important discussion with Angela, I'll be the first to admit it. Yeah, but I, I would also just agree that um, keeping the road, you know, I know it's relatively narrow now. People still speed as the, as uh, Jen was commenting, if you were to widen the road, even if you mark it as a bike lane with a piece of it with paint or something, people might speed even faster, especially at night. No, I appreciate what you're saying. It's a little, I do. little worrisome. It would be interesting to see what's going on with the Highland Avenue intersection, too. I mean, I'd, I, I'll tell you, my first thought is, like I say, you make that a 90-degree intersection if, if, you know, if the room can be found and make a three-way stop out of it. Let's make everyone stop at that intersection before they make the turn. But that's one man's opinion, I guess. I agree with that opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Noah? Hey there. Um, hey, Noah. So when, when the during construction, to start the construction, would all eight lots be completely cleared? No. Or they would be, trees would be left up as buffers and... Right, we'll do it again. It's hard without having the house in front of us. And uh, again, they're home builders, so they'll build some of these homes themselves. I'm sure they'll sell some lots to some other builders out through here, but each lot would be developed on a, you know, on a lot by lot basis, if you will. But the intent would certainly be is, you know, you'll see it happen obviously sooner, if you will, but by going through subdivision rather than being spread out as it has been the last few years. Okay, great, thank you. And so my, sec my second question is um, asking for a little bit of mo more clarification of your conversation with the Portland Water District. Is there currently any sewer and water from Portland Water District on Chamberlain? The 
the closest on Highland, if you will, going in the opposite direction, is probably, what was it, about 400 feet plus or minus from the Highland Avenue Chamberlain Road intersection. Uh, going from the other direction, it's actually on top of the hill, as I recall. Um, their point basically is if the golf, the disc golf, I, I'll get used to this one of these days, if the disc golf land gets developed at some point in the future, they have many ways to access that, if you will, from a water standpoint. Um, so there's no, they don't have any incentive, if you will, to work with us in terms of installing water up that section of Chamberlain Road. And can you tell us the, the relative cost of you installing that versus the relative cost of the water treatment facilities that would be built into the uh, Well, I would just say that the, the water district was, you know, the, the numbers they're talking about is $500 a foot to put water line in nowadays. So I, I haven't had that conversation with these guys if they think they can do it a little bit better. But I mean, at that point in time, you're talking a half a million dollars. Um, okay, I'll have to think a little bit more about that. Um, so my, my final question is that uh, you said specifically no land trust would be interested in this parcel relative to speaking to the, to the wetlands. Um, I would, uh, looking at the, the map, the, you know, the, there's the train tracks, and then on the other side of the train tracks is entirely undeveloped and will be staying, I think, largely undeveloped, um, enabling wetland movements across train tracks from organisms that use, use wetlands. And so I would ask that you um, have a conversation with the, land, the Scarborough Land Trust regarding that, that parcel um, and get, just get a letter documenting either their lack of interest or interest. It's fine either way, but I'd like to hear from them specifically about whether or not they'd be interested in, in the parcel. Yeah, I'd be happy to do it. I'm, uh, again, no, I can only base things upon my past experience, and I just do know that, you know, typically if it's a small, little, isolated piece of land, then, you know. It's not, it, it, as a, somebody who does this kind of work, it's not isolated, um, but, and if they say, no, great, no, no problem, they'll give you a letter saying, we're not interested in this. No, that's, that's absolutely fi a fine answer, but I'd, I'd like to at least have that conversation with them. That's all. We can do it. All right, thank you. Jim? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the concerns I had were, were brought up. I was just curious about um, the clear, any potential clear cutting and how many trees are trying to stay, stay there. And I guess, the only, I guess the only concern I have is we really want to try to keep as many trees in as possible um, because, because of all like the development. And I, I do appreciate that. But at the same time, I don't want to be promising you, as you can sure. understand, again, obviously, again, we're going to have a driveway coming in, a house, you're going to have a well up front and a, and a septic system in the back. So, yeah. you know, obviously our intent will be to maintain some trees along the front, maintain as many trees as we can in the, in, along the property line, if possible, and, and really concentrate more, again, on the rear, if you will, from at least a, 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 a tree save, if you will, yep. between that and the railroad tracks. Fair enough. Uh, on the plan there, uh, is your, forgive me, your, build, your buildable envelope is within inside the hatch line within each lot? Yes, that's correct. That's just based upon building setbacks as required by zone. Okay. Um, and each one is about just under half an acre. Uh, so theoretically, if somebody were to purchase that property, if they wanted to, um, they could clear out that entire buildable envelope and place their place their house there. And if there isn't any public water here, does that mean they're also going to have to put in a leach field before public water gets here? Or uh, sewer, excuse me. Uh, yes, it will be. The leach field will be basically in the backyard, absolutely. Gotcha. And um, I guess not, not, not an expert in this, but just my thought on the board to consider that putting in all these leach fields in here and the small building envelope and less than half an acre really isn't that big. Um, I guess my my concern is I feel like there's maybe one one lot too many, um, and we could maybe make these just a little bit bigger. And again, not knowing certain what the building restrictions or what they're allowed to build in this district. Uh, um, my personal opinion, I think in general, um, we don't necessarily may need to pack so many of them in there, but it's not my property and not my call. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the ordinances do address minimum lot size. Um, they don't address maximum lot size. And uh, these apparently do meet the minimum lot size allowed. Um, just a couple of, I guess, tying up uh, 
comments. Uh, yes, we there is going to be a tea at uh, Highland and Chamberlain, um, so that does offer some options. Uh, we do have the multimodal um, fund that a developer can pay into uh, while the town is getting ready to uh, put more um, sidewalks all along Highland. So rather than, I guess my actual preference would be that you do that rather than build the sidewalk because for a while there's likely to be a sidewalk to no place. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but eventually, and Angela should have that information, there will be sidewalks all the way along Highland so that there will be a, a way to, to connect those, uh, which then puts into another issue uh, the ability to have a crosswalk at that end of that T. Uh, if there's a stop sign uh, at the at Chamberlain that should slow down the traffic, uh, allow pedestrians to cross over, walk up Highland, uh, and really create, um, I think, more safety, uh, especially if there's a sign that says stop sign and crosswalk, crosswalk ahead. Uh, so that you need to work with, uh, if I, I guess, get more information from Angela. Um, I guess you've got a couple of ways to go in terms of lot eight. You can put in a permanent bound, what I would call a permanent boundary. In other words, something that isn't going to rot away. Uh, so whether it's boulders to delineate the um, uh, the the wetlands, um, a a fence uh, of some sort. Certainly, the markers that would be helpful. The alternative is to as I see it is to form an HOA uh, with a deed restriction uh, that so that that wetland where the end of lot eight lot eight is uh, becomes a permanent open space for the for the homeowners association for the residents um, you can put a deed restriction for lot eight in there that says period you know no further uh, that then depends upon the code officer going out there and telling somebody three owners from now that I'm sorry you cut down all those trees, but you're going to have to reforest. Um, in terms of a fence, a, another thing that home uh, HOA could do, and that is the HOA could be responsible for a, a fence that goes all the way across the back of the houses and buffers them from the railroad. I don't think any fence that an HOA could put up would take care of the sound. Um, but I do think it could take care of, of the safety and a very similar fence that's constructed by an HOA and re the HOA is responsible for repairing it as opposed to what's going on in the other part of Highland. Um, that has a certain attraction in terms of safety uh, in terms of children deciding to run down there. Uh, in my discussions this afternoon with the planning board staff concerning uh, what was coming up tonight, uh, I was reminded of the fact that I used to play on the railroad tracks in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, um, climbing down onto them uh, and <coughs> gleefully running across them. Uh, and as I thought about that, I became horrified at the thought of my parents never knowing I was doing that. Um, I, I do think uh, there needs to be some sort of safety issue addressed uh, at that to, to ensure some safety from children going down into that area and onto the railroad tracks. I, I personally think it's the responsibility, it could be, should be perhaps the responsibility of a homeowners association uh, to, provide some, to provide that sort of protection so that individuals who move there who perhaps don't think about that or can't afford to provide a fence there have one anyway because it comes with their homeowner's dues. So I actually would recommend that you take a very hard look at having a, an HOA there both for the wetlands and for a, a fence uh, for safety. You're never going to be able to pay for a fence for uh, noise noise mitigation. That's just not going to happen. But um, I think it's important for safety and there's something that's, um, I guess, 
interesting and enticing about having a similar fence all the way across rather than this fence here, a different fence there, no fence there, as we have upon the rest of, uh, of Highland Avenue. Um, but that is for what we've been doing today, I think is pretty, pretty much giving you comments for your consideration to come back and discuss with us after discussing with the staff uh, for the next part of, of, your, um, of your application. I have a draft motion uh, trackside preliminary subdivision, subdivision review. I move to approve the preliminary subdivision plan of trackside subdivision proposed by NLM Enterprises, LLC. The project is depicted in plan sets prepared by Sebago Technics dated 8-4-23. Findings. The proposal is for an eight-lot residential subdivision on Chamberlain Road. Conditions. Update the final subdivision plan and application to include A, address comments in the staff memo dated 8-28-23 and planning board comments at the 8-28-23 meeting. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Rick Munking has seconded. Doreen? Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Roger Bealy? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Munking? Yes. And James Siebert? No. Thank you. Uh, that's four to one, and the plan passes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We uh, appreciate your comments tonight, and certainly we'll get together with staff to discuss them. Sean, I just have one parting um, comment that I meant to mention earlier. It doesn't make a difference on the approval, but as you move forward, um, siting utility poles is often a long lead time topic, and so um, because there aren't any in this corridor coming up upon these properties, I would just ask that before any of those locations are finalized, um, consult with town staff about what else might be needed to accommodate within the right of way so that they're not in the way. Understood. And actually, that, that is a permit that is required from CMP to actually get those permits from, because the polls will be in the town right away at the end of the day. But thank okay. you, Jeff. Yep, thanks. Thank you very much. Not quite a record yet. Uh, staff report. Uh, the next meeting of the planning board will be Monday, September 18th. Um, other than that, um, I don't have anything but Autumn, I think, might. Uh, we would like to request on September 18th we can do a workshop at 6 o'clock. Eric and I have been working on our calendar and some proposed changes for the development review process for 2024. We think it will be exciting news, but we'd like to go over it with you all, if available. So you don't have to let me know tonight. Just we'll put another email request out. Uh, September 18th. Yeah, usually, uh, usually closer to the end of the year, we, we have a discussion about what the calendar would look like for the next year. Autumn has got a proposal that I think is attractive. So she wants uh, the opportunity to, to spend some time with us talking about it. Minor development reviews. None at this time. Administrative amendment report. None at this time. Correspondence. None. Oh, but we did. I will forward it. We received oh, an nice. email from um, an abutter to LaPlante Electric. You all may recall that came in for approval prior to, to me getting here. Uh, they had until July 18th to bring the site into compliance. LaPlante Electric is down on Route 1 and Queens Drive. Um, I have personally been working with this particular abutter and LaPlante Electric, as has Brian Longstaff, the zoning administrator, trying to get the site into compliance. But I'm going to forward the email, um, and then you let me know if you have any questions. Uh, it's been a lengthy year trying to get that done. I would always offer, if we ever have the opportunity to have a site plan approval after the effect, that we put a specific date that they must comply with instead of the one year site plan. Um, so, lessons learned. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps you could talk about that at the next workshop, too. Uh, planning board comments. Rick. Just want to remind folks that on October 1st, there is the first annual Scarborough Sustainability Day going to be held at the Wentworth School and the surrounding areas. There are going to be some EV bicycles and cars 
And um, from what I understand, there's a chance that a Scarborough resident could go home with a brand new heat pump water heater. Um, so just lots of education. Uh, it's being put together by the Sustainability Committee and the Conservation Commission. So just putting that out there. What Keep your eyes out. What date was that? October 1st. Sunday? Sunday. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Jen? Um, additionally, on September 26th, um, we will be having a public meet. Are we calling it a public meeting? I don't think it's an open house workshop. Come on September 26th. <laughs> um, it'll be... Uh, I think more open house style. So the transportation committee will be taking um, comments from the public that will then be incorporated into the town's transportation master plan. So there will be some um, no pre no formal presentation necessarily, but uh, mapping exercises available for people to come and provide um, their uh, feedback or um, comments, problem areas that they're aware of in town, uh, things that they'd like to see. Um, we are looking forward to hearing and collecting some input at that time. And there will also be comparable opportunities to provide input on, on the same topics um, online, virtually. Thank you. Noah. I have a question for the planning staff, please. Um, can you, can you direct us to where, a, if somebody's coming to do a project and they want to know what they can plant, wh where is that on the planning website or are they, are they handed a document when they come in to, for, their, for their application? Sure, so we typically will email them. The plant list that you are referring to is not actually approved yet. The Conservation Commission recommended it to approval. It's been going through long range planning committee with other landscaping changes. And so Eric will uh, provide the list and we encourage people to look at it. We have gotten quite a bit of feedback that all of the plants are not um, perfect for our growing climates and that some of the species are not as well suited as others. So we are through the long range planning committee process going through the plant list and adding. Uh, right now we have a bit of flexibility that we're adding in, but I'm also sending it out to some review, development review, because I, I can't continually argue and don't want to about people planting from the list. So we wanna make sure the list works. Um, but Eric, that's a really long answer, but Eric typically emails the, the folks that ask for it. That ask for it. Mm -hmm. so it's not on our website right now. The landscape ordinance <clears throat> that is on our website right now uh, is very small and very limited. And then we have the design guidelines uh, for commercial districts from 2009. So there is an ordinance consolidation page on the planning under current projects that we just got uploaded to the website. And it identifies all of the changes that we're starting with. Uh, the lighting ordinance is the first one that's made its way through, and then you'll see, and then landscaping is the next one. So we're very, it's very fastly coming to um, ordinance committee, hopefully in October, and then uh, back to you all to town council and here, so you'll see it. But it's, I think it's a really good body of work because it addresses a lot of the conversations that we find ourselves repeatedly having about landscape islands and trees required and percentage of landscape. So it's really inclusive, but that landscape list is part of it. Yeah, you know, I, I believe right now what's actually in the ordinances is, is under the design standards, commercial design standards uh, that you should have in your notebook. Um, and that's what's sent out. Uh, the list that's come from conservation uh, is what um, Autumn is talking about and while we're trying to encourage people to use that list, to move towards that list, if they want to say, no, well, here's the list that we actually have and it's in the standards, then, well, that's in the standards. That's what we have. So we have an official list that is on the website and is in your handbook um, under the commercial design standards. And then we have the work that we're trying to move through with the consultation with um, the conservation and, and other groups. So that's where that sits. So how, how would you rectify a situation where uh, a developer says that, as you just said, but wants to plant a plant that is on the 
state of Maine's do not sell, do not plant list, which means that it is banned for sale in the state of Maine. We have uh, the ordinance, uh, the ordinance addresses uh, the fact that there should be no, basically, um, no banned species, doesn't it? It's uh, no invasive, there's, there's right. something that says, you know, it's basically if it's on the main banned list, then it's on the banned list. Right. And that is a little easier um, in the interim to enforce because it's a state mandate and the state can change and add to that list at a much faster rate than we may, so we'll always um, be able to enforce that. But we're just in, in a middle ground right now where we, we have the one list that's in Chapter 405B and the design guidelines, and then we also have a list that we send to people to to try to get compliance, to get, to get ahead of it. The state list is an annual update. And the new ordinance uh, actually refers to the list as well, um, for the state list. Any other comments? I have none. Thank you all for a really good meeting. Um, we're we're going home. We we did not meet the eight thirty the eight thirty record, but came close. Uh, thank you and good work tonight. Um, I, I somehow or other the our work is getting lighter. Well, I actually have a theory about that, and that is with the new rate of growth ordinance, um, it creates less of a frantic nature, frantic push to get everything out immediately and allows developers to spread out some of the work and some of the application process, which kind of evens out some of our work. And I, I hope I'm not proven wrong, you know, in two months, but um, I think I think we're seeing some of the effect of that and the effectiveness of, of that ordinance in terms of what's coming to us for our, for our look-see. So thank you very much. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, I heard three so moved, and so I will take those also as seconds. Thank you. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>